This meeting is being recorded. Okay, we are now recording. Um, hi to the couple more people who, who just joined. Um, okay, so this is our fourth uh, 4844 breakout. Uh, we have a lot on the agenda today. Hopefully we can we can get uh, get through it all. Um, but at a high level, I want to discuss kind of where we're at with the implementations, uh, Get and Prism being the two main prototypes we're working on. And I see some folks here who like signaled they wanted to potentially work on other implementations as well. Um, so talk about where the current ones are, what are the potential blockers, and 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 um, what should we do next uh, to go beyond the current DevNet we have. Um, I know there was a lot of Conversations also happening about the libraries to use for KZG and clients. Um, so if you could get a quick update on that, that'd be great. And then uh, Danny, you put out a doc about uh, sync yesterday. That was quite good. Um, so you can probably discuss that. And then the last thing uh, I really want us to get to everything else, just kind of a bonus, but it's uh, there's a bunch of people from the community who want to contribute to this. So if we can take a few minutes to kind of walk through what are some tasks and, and where, where, where people can be helpful. Um, I think that'll be good. Um, and then, yeah, uh, if we have time to do updates on the ceremony, um, that'll, be, that'll be great, but uh, we may not get there. Um, I guess to kick it off, uh, Roberto or Mofi, do either of you wanna give a quick update on where we're at with uh, the current PRISM and GET implementations? I'll let Mofi take that since I've, I've been out a few days. Cool. Of course. Yeah, sure. Um, so where are we at? Yeah, so there have been a couple of spec changes, um, both in consensus and execution. Uh, for one, the fee market updates, we, um, we have like a fully fleshed out um, specification for how like the fee market and gas pricing should work. And that is being implemented in um, our execution in the client, Geth in this case. Um, I have a PR open. I had like a PR open that was merged, but there were some bugs in it. And I have like another PR to like fully flesh out and iron out the chinks there. Um, this change does not include um, Ansgar's most recent updates. It includes, uh, this change is like targeting what my client already like uh, merged into the spec repo. Um, that is to, move the state uh, from the um, from from the EVM to the um, block header and um, have like a simple um, gas price targeting rule for the um, for the blobs. Um, so that's currently in progress. We're also currently working on the um, corresponding change in consensus. In this case, it would be the prison client. Um, this work is uh has been going on for some time now. It's taking a little bit longer because, like, we kind of like to be having a flame war in the uh, Discord channel. There's some compatibility issues we need to be mindful of when implementing this change and integrating it with uh, Geth. Um, so those are the two main things um we're we are currently working on. Got it. Um, and I guess on the point of that uh that second uh, PR, but Angsgar, Esgar, I know it's been open for uh, a while now. There's been like a lot of back and forth on it. Um, Angsgar, yeah, you're on the call. Do you want to give us a quick update of where things are at there? Sure. So um, I'm not sure basically uh, how many people uh, have had a look. Basically, um, it's a I don't know moderate uh, moderately sized change to the to the fee market. Just basically introducing uh, so so in the, in the in the EIP as 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 is right now. Um, we used to want to um, basically charge charge an ETH directly. Um, it, was, it was basically like we we had this we had this floating floating gas price for 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 blobs, and now we're we're moving. We want to move to a system where basically we we introduce a second type of gas that uh, after some back and forth we want to call a data gas. Um, and 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 for now, blobs are the only thing that that is being charged in data gas. Basically, as uh, I think the 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 PR is, is uh, kind of mostly ready. There are some small questions still remaining around. Um, uh, well, well, uh, one big one is just um, that 
if, if, if people remember, there was this idea that we also wanted to, to bring 1559 over to a time-based uh, targeting system away from a block-based targeting system so that we have constant throughput over time, even if they're missed slots. Uh, I had an EAP there in, in the past, and it uh, turns out it's easier to do um, if we do this excess uh, accounting that, that we want to do with 4844. Um, but there's still some open questions around, do we want this to be per slot or do we want this to be per second because what if slot times change in the future and uh, there are a few kind of attached um questions around there um uh, just because ideally once we log a design in here we also would want to move the main uh base fee 1559 mechanism over to this design as well uh, in, a, in later fork so we have to make sure that it also works for, for the main 1559 mechanism. And because the gas limit there is currently voted on every block, it's a little bit more complicated. So, so again, so basically this, this whole kind of sub, sub question around time, time-based uh, targeting is still a little bit open. Um, but besides that, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, Mostly ready, and again, it's I I don't think it's it's a big change um, from from a conceptual point of view. Of course, implementation wise, there are some some tricky issues, um, but but yeah, uh, so 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 I I would expect this to be to to, to be merged uh, say next week. Got it. I think, with, yeah, yeah. I think right now this is probably the main blocker for like launching your next version of the DevNet. Um, what is the yeah, yeah, is yeah. So if if we can try and get what, this, what's like, a, result... uh, so, so in terms of yeah, go ahead. Right, just just from my understanding, like in terms of implementation, I assume you'd only want to start kind of implementing the changes once they once they merged, right? Because before then, it's kind of tricky yeah, to I mean, rely on them being especially stable. Especially if uh, if <laughs> it's unclear whether you're going to go with a time or slot based approach, right? I can imagine right. that that changes the implementation. Quite a bit. Okay, makes sense. Uh, would it would it be preferable then to maybe try and just uh, merge this PR and then later on uh, have, have a se separate one for for moving to to time based, or would it be better to just resolve this first so that we then wouldn't have to change the implementation again? There is a stub in the implementation for testing. We could merge and say use the stub for this devnet and. Uh, have a warning on the other part. Um, what do you mean by a stub in the implementation? How would that no, work? No, there's Nanskar, isn't there isn't there like a section on quote for early implementations just do X? Oh that's so oh, yeah but that's that's in the existing AP already. That's not a new thing. And that's a yeah, constant that's, price, right? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of like what we relied on for the first DevNet, but I think one of the goals we want for the second DevNet is to have like a more concrete um, representation of what the spec is, so we can start building tooling on top of it and um, start collecting meaningful metrics. And having using stubs or something like that wouldn't be very useful for the second DevNet. Right. I guess if we're just balancing trying to ship in the next couple of weeks, some sort of DevNet, then it seems like there's going to be uncertainty at least for the next five days on uh, on this gas market. So, you know, we just have to find the right trade-off there. Yeah. I guess from an implementation perspective, uh, Mofi, I'm curious, like if we were to do it all block-based, like the current, um, like, yeah, like, like the current PR uh, kind of points to, and then switch it, you know, in like a few weeks to time based. Um, is that better? Because like we can move forward and, and at least have a second version of the DevNet, or is it like going to be so much work to then rip out all the block based fee market um, that it's it's not worth it? Um, it would certainly be way less work than the initial fee market update where we had to like change the payload and um, update both consensus and execution. So yeah, I think we could we could merge this or implement this now in the DevNet for the upcoming DevNet. And then if we do move to like a slot-based um, gas pricing time, then that could easily be integrated with the updated DevNet 
and we can iterate from there. So yeah, it will be easier, I think. Sounds sounds good. And I think there are like some partial changes that are uncontroversial, like changing instead of charging one data gas per blob, uh, we wanted to go to something like basically one one data gas per per, per blob byte or something. Uh, just just so that it's it's easier later on with with the time based changes, but I think that part is uncontroversial. So I think uh, we I, yeah I could get the PR into a form where hopefully can be merged pretty soon, um, um, and then maybe have like a very small separate second PR uh, a little bit later. If that's uh, that seems like the most practical way to go, then yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the time base versus like slot base might be something that like requires broader discussions. So like, yeah, I want to make sure that we don't like move to time base and then there's some pushback by client teams for a reason or another. And we've implemented all of that already across the different prototypes, whereas like slot base seems pretty uncontroversial. Right, that's my thinking as well, basically it's yeah. split up into the uncontroversial PR and then one that we have some more time to debate. Okay, yeah, that, I think that sounds, that sounds great. Any other thoughts, comments on that? When do you think we can iterate on the, the last couple little changes in this PR? Onscar. Um, yeah, I was I was basically holding off a little bit to 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 get this the time based results off. But then, if we want to just basically fast track this PR first, then I'll uh, go through uh, whatever remaining open comments there um, later today, and and then we can hopefully get this merged by I don't know early mid next week at the latest. Cool. So I guess we'll get this merge right before DevCon. Um, and then either during or right after DEF CON, we can launch another DevNet uh, using this. But, um, and yeah, if anyone's like looking into starting an implementation or like continuing one of the existing prototypes, I uh, think can also just reference that PR. Um, okay, anything else on that? Okay, uh, and then there was another PR that got merged on the consensus spec by George uh, about the reverse bit ordering. Um, and uh, I think the question was whether we want to include, oh, thanks, thank God. Uh, yeah, whether we want to include this in the next version of the DevNet as well. Um, yeah, I forget what's the reason we were thinking why we might not include it. Uh, Mofi, do you, you remember? Um, I think it was more of a, a, not exactly cosmetic change, but it's a change we're, that we're making to make proto-dank sharding fully compatible or more compatible with um, full dank sharding. And this change tweaks the KCG crypto a little bit to make that happen, but it's not critical for the for protodank sharding itself. Yeah, that's and correct. So it, um, like, but the, the changes are also extremely trivial in that I think um, you can implement everything by just reordering uh, two constant arrays like the Lagrange like setup and the roots of Unity. Um, so in a way it is very easy to implement, but I mean, I agree. You can test everything on 4844 only without, um, implementing this. Cool. Thanks for that color. Okay. So does it make sense to hold off on implementing this in the next version of the DevNet? Okay. No, no strong objections. Um, sweet. And then 
on uh, last bit on the implementation, I know there's a couple of people who like wanted to start looking at, at different client implementations. So we have Geth and Prism have prototypes now, um, but as we get more, that'll be super valuable because we can do some cross client testing. Um, and Terence, and I believe with the help of Danny, you've put together a really good uh, CL implementers guide. Um, I'll link this in the in the chat here, but. Terence, you want to take a minute or two to, to kind of walk through that? Sure, yeah. Hello, hello, everyone. So um, high level wise, I haven't just been thinking about like, um, what does it mean for a client team to implement 4844, like at a, at a very high level? So I basically break down the documentations into like several portions, such as like storage requirement, like what, like what does the storage increase? Cause like when we first started the beacon chain, right? We were advertising people to get one terabyte SSD and that's probably not gonna fly anymore with the merge and not with 4844. So that's something to consider. And also the networking requirement as well. Just currently we advertise like 10 megabytes symmetrical and recommended 20, 25 megabits per second. So how does that affect that area as well? And um, as of syncing, which I think Danny will cover that a little bit later, like what type of, what type of validations we should do for syncing, especially if just right now we can do forward syncing, we can do backward syncing, and then you have these like edge cases that you can have a block without a blob, or you can have a blob without a block. So how does that work basically? And then last but not least, like, 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 um, how, like how do we treat the four choice mode with without a blob, that's definitely something very interesting. Because right now we have this no notion of uh, optimistic mode, which means that the CL client can still pin the EL client to sync to head. But this doesn't make much sense with when a block doesn't have a blob. So that's something worth considering. Yep, so that's pretty much it. Take a look at the documentation and you know, feel free to give feedback. No, yeah, that's... That's a really good overview of all, all the bits. Um, and if someone's yeah looking into another CL implementation, uh, hopefully it's it's useful. Um, anyone so regarding the bandwidth concerns, yeah. is there um, anything we can do to like um, not have uh, not have every node consume root of the number of PS bandwidth of the for the blob distribution? Are you talking about the gossip amplification factor? Yeah, exactly. It's not root on um, the consensus mm -hmm. layer, it's like six to eight target rather than right. failing totally, but it's- It still seems way. very wasteful given the amount of data that we're now considering. Like, I mean, I, I think that- Certainly. I would say one megabyte, two megabyte is maybe untenable given yeah. the gossip amplification factor. Yeah, exactly. So. Do we have any ideas on how we can, could reduce this? So I guess that the, basically the two options are either you gossip to less people um, or you gossip smaller things, right? And oh, Yeah, or you... Well, you smaller would... things doesn't help if they have the same amplification factor, like whether you make it like one megabyte or like 128 kilobytes and uh, times eight like that doesn't change the well, actually just having less of payload max but yeah i mean you can reduce you can you can reduce the fan out um or distribution factor but then uh that potentially one increases gossip times and two uh i think begins to reduce the results are nodes aware of their own bandwidth? Like, do they do they do clients or does P two P somehow know this? I do not believe so. Um, because right, so one way, if like, if nodes knew this information, right, then we could simply say nodes that know that they are on a low bandwidth connection, say less than twenty five megabits per second, just sure. reduce their uh, outgoing amplification and maybe they can also set a flag to their peers saying hey like uh, don't just send me the payloads like just give me a notification that is available and uh, and I'll ask for ask one peer for it 
Right. I mean, that's because the my, other my, my, my suspicion is that we have a very question, dense yeah. network of high bandwidth nodes, right? Like I would say like most nodes probably easily have a hundred megabit or more and quite a few will have gigabits. Um, and so if we simply make it so that these nodes just distribute among themselves very quickly, then the other nodes can easily get it from them. I mean, that may not be like the perfect solution for like the ultimate sort of um, sharding implementation because it certainly introduces some centralization vectors among nodes. But like, I think for 4844, which is kind of a temporary thing, it may just be good enough. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, impl implied in your statement was also, you know, push versus pull, essentially, like, can some of these nodes pull it down rather than getting it gossiped? Exactly. And uh, these should be the lower bandwidth nodes. And then we can still get extremely fast distribution in the peer-to-peer -peer network because all the high bandwidth nodes just gossip it as usual. And the others, like, with exceeding probability will have one uh, of those high bandwidth nodes among their peers. Right. So the, the easiest way to do so without doing deep changes to gossip sub is essentially have the blob, um, assuming that these are two separate network payloads, having the blob sidecar be an optional um, topic. And that if you get a header, if you're not on the blob sidecar and you get headers, um, or beacon beacon blocks, then you then go and ask your peers for mm, uh, requests. Right. And you actually know which peers to ask for the request because you know which peers are advertising that they're on that topic. Right. It's, it, right. It, it could potentially work. It, you know, there's trade-offs here and it's kind of a hack and, it, and, you know, how do users configure that value? And then you're kind of like shifting the honesty of like the, the healthy mesh and, and that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. um, there's... Yeah, there's so the one thing to note is that um, the blobs um, block validity is tied to the blobs now. And right. I'm curious to know, like, what, what were the ar arguments, if there were any, to for the beacon blocks to like always like gossip them rather than do like a pull based model as we have now? The beacon blocks? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in general, it's very important. This is a very important message that literally every node gets. Um, there is a pull-based backup with the gossip sub chatter I want, I have, uh, but it's also just a product of kind of using the gossip sub stuff off the shelf. You know, it's primarily a gossip protocol. Gotcha. So, but, and, 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 and yeah, so in terms of designing like push first pull, like you can always, there are strategies where you're kind of like gossiping to some amount of peers and you're chattering to others. Um, and that's kind of what's happening here. Um, you have to, but because it's a high value distribution message, you, you have to gossip to some amount, like you, otherwise it becomes very slow. You know, you pretty much, you're pretty much gossiping, but just in a slow method. Right. So I asked this because doesn't that rationale extend to blobs given that we cannot like validate beacon blocks until um, the associated sidecar is available. Right. I mean, <clears throat> the I mean, my argument here, the argument here that I bring is not that they sh that don't, shouldn't be gossiped. My argument is that it's enough to gossip it to some of the nodes. And the same, actually, I mean, I think, I think if we wanted to, we could do the same thing for, uh, for the beacon blocks. Um, it's just less urgent because they tend to be smaller. Right. So there's likely to be. But I think I think the current system, in my opinion, is very wasteful. Like I mean, they're definitely like, I mean, given given more engineering work, we could build a much better system for this. I think that that has much less overhead. But I don't some of the, some of the overhead here is also in resilience to attack, like that. Like that's part of the gas. The re redundancy is not always. Bad. Yeah, but. No, but well, but I mean, this this is extreme. Like, I mean, there are better ways to achieve redundancy than just sending copies, right? So basically, erasure coding. So I think there are much better systems than what we have now. This the system we have now is just very simple. The better system would require more engineering work for sure. But yeah, 
S setting that aside, Mofi, I think um, it is very important that both of these messages are widely gossiped to the network. Um, you know, quote, the data availability check is get all of that data. Um, I think the intuition here is uh, if the strategy becomes partial push versus pull rather than just full push or full pull, then maybe there's a there's still a, um, a distribution time in that trade off there that still is reasonable. You know, it's like if 50 percent of the network is is pushing and have waste and 50 percent is, is pulling and thus is a little bit slower, we might still be able to get a distribution model that's like sub that four seconds that that we're we're good with, but that's just a, you know, a hope on that trade-off space. Gotcha. Thanks. Is there, is there a way to, um, to only tell one of your peers, uh, that you're subscribed to a subnet. So say, I, I know that I'm a low bandwidth node. I still want to get the blobs, but I don't want to get a lot of copies from them. So I only tell one of my peers or maybe five of my peers so that the expectation is I get one blob um, that I'm subscribed to this. I mean, it's a bit hacky, but um, <laughs> that might also... Huh? I mean, off the shelf, probably no. Um, yeah. You know, I, you could imagine some more, some additional configurable parameter that wouldn't be too difficult to get there, get into there. Um, but then the kind of analysis of gossip sub all the attacks that it's presumably resilient against you know i think you begin to degrade something there what's is this something we need to test somehow like obviously we know we're introducing a bunch more requirements uh the gossiping level it seems unclear how much more we can introduce and what the effects of that are on the network um what's so this is like, something we definitely need to test um you know right. if we naively How, don't think anything we need to figure out what is the safe gossip distribution number you know what is the safe number for this or you know if we're not happy with that safe number then we need to be making engineering changes pop on our end is do, opening up and beginning to do some simulation analysis and hopefully we'll have something at least on the bare bones if we assume x distribution of bandwidth and one megabyte two megabyte blocks then you know, this is this is what it looks like uh, before devcon but there's definitely some additional work to do here this is like one of the things i'm most concerned about um on current 4844 is that we don't know what the network can handle in terms of pushing this data around the one megabyte two megabyte safety assumption comes from starkware's at least i believe starkware's big red dot analysis from 2019 or 2020 where they pushed around large blocks and paid for them large relatively uncompressible blocks on mainnet and showed that the uncle rate was not greatly affected that's the that's the best we have right now um i'll share that link. Uh, yeah by the way uh, i wanted to bring something so maybe uh, i will bring it now because it is somehow related look i like i'm not really comfortable because uh, of the fact that we don't know those numbers and i i feel that it uh, it has impacted the choice of kzg and for example if uh, when i read the argumentation uh, uh, that says that we cannot use uh, an alternative to kzg um, the main argument is that uh, either it won't be um, compatible with data availability sampling, or it will consume uh, uh, more data. But I'm saying that the impact of KZG, the fact that it requires a trusted setup is huge. So um, I think we should spend some time to do this analysis and see how much we can handle in terms of bandwidth and storage and stuff like that, and then decide if we can use another uh, polynomial commitment scheme. I don't know if that's clear, but yeah I'm can you can you can you name a concrete commitment scheme because we have we have done this analysis that's okay, been done for okay, years right okay this is not okay. not a new idea like i mean we we have for a long time thought about stacking Merkle roots we have thought of using fry directly fry, okay. and like it, they, and, and they what, are all is, they're all very far from being practical like very far okay very far so it is very and, clear that we can choose them and Dr. the IPAs are an order of magnitude larger 
Yeah, IPAs are definitely quite a bit larger um, and they also only give you, uh, yeah, so proofs would be like several kilobytes, I think like around five to 10 or so, depending on which exact uh, scheme you use. And uh, there's also a big problem in that the pr uh, proofs, uh, there's no efficient algorithm to compute the proofs. Uh, so that's a major downside as well, which we have for KCG. Um, yeah, so IPAs would also only solve the trusted setup problem and not be post-quantum. So to me personally, the trusted setup is a much smaller problem than uh, it not being uh, post-quantum. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat related to uh, bandwidth concerns, I'm, I'm working on setting up sort of like a community cluster for observability around the 4844 testnet. Um, so I'm essentially only running it on my on my nodes, but I am measuring a bunch of uh, infrastructure metrics. Um, I can also add network metrics to that. Um, and then hopefully some point next week I can um, I can give broader access to some dashboards and things like that. So at the very least, we have some baseline for what the current testnet is using. The only concern and I guess question I have right now is um, how how good of a signal is, um, or how good of a signal are these metrics from a test net, considering the test net is fairly small right now? Sorry, if you were to run like large blocks on a test net? Yeah. Uh, I just, I think one, they're small, and two, the distribution of nodes does not necessarily reflect that of mainnet. Mainnet might have one way more highly yeah. powered nodes and way more home nodes. You know, like even people that are running on test nets for that are home stakers might not might be using cloud instance because one, they don't mm -hmm. care about the security of that. And and two, you know, they don't want to overload their local bandwidth. So like I I don't think it's super representative. And then when we get into sim it doesn't mean that it's not, it's not worth doing the experiments, but we just have to con try to sure. contextualize. But given, you know, and then we go into simulations or anything like that, and then we're going to be guessing the distribution of of what nodes look like. Um, we can certainly do some yeah. worst case. Let's say there's 10,000 nodes and they're 10 megabits per second and see what happens. And you can also do some pen and paper analysis, but uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Can you um, remotely analyze the in the um the upstream of nodes somehow or you can <laughs> i'm not 100 I, sure i know you can do you can like try to measure late round trip latency but i don't mm -hmm. think that really gets you yeah what you yeah, want no, that, yeah yeah i just was just wondering if you basically just like dos each node for like a second <laughs> and see uh how much you can get through or something yeah, so one of the related uh, things uh, that was being discussed in sharded data was writing sort of like a spammer tools to just spam um, blob uh, blob data to, to a node. Um, and the primary reason I'm setting up some of this observability stuff is so that I can spam my own node and measure performance that way um, and some other analysis later on. But just for this, like, I don't know, we could, we could set up some we could set up a spammer for to, to to do like a certain size of blob at a certain frequency on just a single node and see if we can extrapolate anything from the metrics we see from that. But I'm not sure how again how accurate that would be. I think that'll be helpful for a different reason though, because you want the throughput on the network to be like well below what a node can handle in like mm -hmm. the worst case. So uh, when you think about, I think spamming a single node, you know, if you can, if you know that your node can process, I don't know, like 20 megabyte blobs per slots and we're, you know, considering going with two, then at least we know we're like safe on that front. But if like at three megabyte blobs per slot, your node has issues like staying in sync or, or, or anything else, like I think that's really helpful to know. Um, so it's different from the gossiping, but it tells you like, you know, can your node actually process the amount of stuff that it's receiving on mainnet with like a really large error bar um, mm -hmm. or, or margin of safety, basically. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Another 
potential idea that Donker and some other guys uh, were discussing was assuming we stay in a low gas paradigm, uh, maybe even on, on the weekends doing some sort of analysis, you could potentially abuse call data in a way like Starkware did a couple of years ago um, and send large blocks on mainnet, but potentially do a better analysis. So maybe have some sentry nodes, see the different timing, uh, maybe go to various client teams and other operators and get logs of like when things were received um, and, you know, try I mean, to get better data on mainnet. I mean, the best possible metric you can get is actually just seeing at looking at attestations. Right. So right. I would argue that uh, setting up a few nodes that just watch all the attestation subnets and see the delay uh, for each validator of their attestations um, can give you a lot of information already because it basically tells you at least for all the staking nodes how well they are doing at processing those blocks. So we'd want we'd probably want to know when random nodes around the network get the blocks, when random nodes around the network get attestations, and watch chain data for blocks and attestations. Yeah, and would you know, uh, would fifteen fifty nine make this harder to do? Um, I mean, you only forward. need to do it for like ten blocks or something, right? Okay, so so your gas price like, will just go up like a little bit. What, what does something. 10 blocks do? I think it's a bit I think more 10 than blocks maybe four like, X. Yeah. We'll burn yeah, about a bit more than two X. Yeah. 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 But so it's, it's you know but it's reasonable. It, it's not 40 X. Yeah. 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 It'd be a good experiment. The thing is if the experiment doesn't do well, it's hard to iterate on that experiment, but it could at least give us some information and know kind of which direction to go in. Yeah. I think that would be actually a really cool <clears throat> thing to do. And do we know how much the Stark? I mean, Abdel, uh, yeah, you know, now I, if you could find out how much it costs. <laughs> well, last okay, we, we, well, we can we, from the gas price. We know exactly how oh, much it's gonna cost. Yeah, actually, right? yeah, yeah. It's very easy. You just need to, just need to find <laughs> the out. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. can have the experiment wait until <laughs> some minimum gas costs to start. Exactly. Yeah. So I have a follow -up, follow -up question, uh, Duncan. Um, can, can we leverage uh, the efficiency of KZG to improve the data availability guarantees on the protocol? I mean, like, for example, uh, Ido from Stackware, which is on the call, uh, thought about a system where you could do some random queries based on uh, random data, like Ronda, for example, and to do some random qu queries that will be included uh, in the block to, to enforce. Because for the moment, we, 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 tr uh, we trust and we rely on honest uh, validators implementation. But can, can, can't we leverage uh, the efficiency of KZG to, I don't know if that's clear, maybe Ido, you want to jump in and explain what you had in mind? And, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. this is completely off topic, it feels at the moment, but I'm happy to answer that question, private messages. Yeah, if we, just because we have only 20 minutes, I would agree okay. if we can move this to the, to the Discord. Um, Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it would be worth it to try and uh, back to the Starkware thing, if someone wants to look into like how how we could replicate and, and adapt it, I think that would be that would be really valuable. Um, and and also so the, like I mean, creating those blocks is trivia, right? Like, I mean, I I can create a script that will do this. Um, the only the only thing that needs to happen is that someone needs to set up the instrumentation so that we actually get good data from it. I mean, we will get some on on chain data, just yeah. on chain attestations will yeah. already be pretty interesting, but it would be a bit wasteful not to have like yeah. some notes that simply record all the attestations and give us much more data. Yeah, so using Sentry nodes or using the diversity of nodes that maybe client teams are already operating. Yeah. I think there are also operators who already do this, like who basically like watch the whole peer to peer network. Um, so just getting in contact with one of them, if they could simply like be part of the experiment and give us that data, yeah. then and, we don't have to do it ourselves. Yeah. What's the easy, like if somebody wants to do this, like what's the list of metrics they should be asking? Uh, we want, eat, yeah, we want for a given node, when did they first see a block? When did they first see every single individual attestation that they got off the wire? 
Um, and I think that's probably it because then everything else is chain data because then you want to see were blocks orphaned and did you have high attestation inclusion rates? Yeah. Okay. So just first time to a block, first time to every attestation for each block. Um, <laughs> I yeah, and that no aggregate thing as well. It's yeah. best if these are, well, it's best if these are maybe fully connected nodes that see all attestations because they're on all yeah. attestation subnets. But then all of a sudden, that's potentially a biased node with respect to where they sit in the mesh because they're so well connected. Um, but uh, I don't know right. how much that, that and I think couple and data coupled with many of those nodes across the world, I think would still be very, very good. And should we try and like replicate low-ish bandwidth? Like you could imagine doing this with like a 10 megabyte node, a 25 one, a hundred gig, a hundred meg, and then a gig. Yeah, I mean, if we were willing to not just use other people's nodes, but yeah. um, provide our own Sentry nodes, then I would do a distribution of Sentry nodes. Yeah. Prism, we can do that pretty easily in our uh, from our mainnet nodes, and then uh, I mean, I also have a few at home nodes. Mm -hmm. I can set those up as well. I think we have the infrastructure to monitor those data already. Nice. But do um, you have like do you have a way to record it? Like, is that exists? Yeah. I mean, some. Yeah. Okay. Today we capture the arrival time for everything. Okay. Yeah. And you have nodes that would be powerful enough to just subscribe to or. Uh, gossip sub channels yeah that's not hard either we just have to basically yeah. upgrade the instance and then just yeah. add more peer and stuff i mean if you think that's easy to, for you to do then i think like yeah i mean that would be great we should just do it and like who knows how long gas will be cheap so like let's do it soon yeah and i guess for gas like we can find uh, we, yeah, can we can find figure a way out to, the budget. Yeah. to pay for the gas that's yeah <laughs> Um, and okay, and then yeah, the, the thing I was skimming this Starkware one, uh, the Starkware post, and they said they did this over a range of like 6,000 blocks. Is that roughly the duration we'd want? Um, I think we'd want like a burst or a handful yeah. of bursts. I don't think we're going to be doing a 6,000 block test. 6,000 blocks is like yeah. 20 hours, or like it's like a day basically on proof of work blocks. Yeah, yeah, no, this is like a I think the I shortest and most uh, most intensive burst possible is what gives us the most information. Right. Okay. Like we'd rather have 10 2 megabytes blocks than 21 megabyte blocks. Got it. Yeah, yeah, right. And you know, and, and and it's something that we can do this for a minute or two and then see what's going on. And then if we want to do additional analysis, assuming gas prices stay low, well, we can. I guess we should also ask ourselves before, like, is there any chance that we might actually break it? <laughs> should we do like a one or two block test first and to see like... Yes. <laughs> yes. I guess please. to find break it. <laughs> <laughs> I have no worry that it would recover. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But then those, um, those validators might want um, okay. compensation for their missed attestations. Okay, we're going down, <laughs> oh, we're sure. going downhill okay. quickly here. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I guess, um, Terence, like on the PRISM side, is there anything like, like, do you need help from anyone else? Or is this something like your team can just set up and, and, and then uh, we can get, you know, somebody else to work on just building the blocks and, and scheduling when the actual kind of test would happen. Right. I think a good place to start is just like a one pager, like a requirement. So we can yeah. put those on paper and then share with the necessary party. And I think that's a good place to start. And once we have that one pager, I think relatively yeah. it's, it, it's pretty easy. Cool. Um, it, Terrence, is it easy for others that are running Prism infrastructure to get similar data? Um, well, I will probably publish like a branch with style modification. So as long as they update to that branch, it should be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then one thing that would be neat is, yeah, if we maybe ask, like, if we ask across other client teams, it would be good to sanity check that like at least another, if there's another client yeah. team for whom it's easy to get this data, um, you know, <laughs> getting just two that like roughly aligned, uh, yeah, would, 
make at least me feel much more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Prism might be like really well connected or really poorly connected yeah. due to something that we're not aware of. So getting another yeah. one yeah. would be nice. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure like we can find some other like node operator somewhere like who's not a client team who wants to do this or already basically records all of this, um, you know, whether that's like a staking provider or like a team like, I don't know, Block Native or like someone that like has highly connected node. Uh, yeah. Um, sweet. Yeah, no, this was, this was really good. Um, is there someone who feels like they want to take on writing this one pager of requirements and, and sharing this with, uh, with the group here? I can help. I'll make a document right now and start filling in some notes and share it here. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Um, sweet. I think, yeah, so we spent, we have only like 10 minutes left, uh, but I think this was, this was quite valuable. Um, oh yeah. Mega slab. That's it. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, thanks, Terrence. Um, okay. So yeah, we had a, a couple more things, but Quickly, uh, on the KZG library side, are there any notable updates there that people wanted to share? I know there's the C KZG uh, effort that's going on. Uh, Dankrad, do you maybe want to quickly give a quick update on that? Yeah, so uh, Raman and I uh, uh, used uh, built on top of uh, Ben Edgington's work, CKCG, um, a library that uh, has uh, low-level implementations of all the um, functions necessary uh, for um, for 4844. Um, it's built on BLSD, so it's um, all pretty fast and um, everything's implemented in C. Um, and yeah, I mean, right now we're just uh, basically looking for a client or clients that actually want uh, to use these functions so that we can uh, build an API together, basically like uh, people were, I think, a little bit unhappy with uh, the Blast API. So, like, I think it would be worth like making something that actually works for clients and makes their life easy. So, like, if there's anyone on this call who says, like, right now we need to, we need a library for this, or we need a faster library than what we have now, then it would be great to connect. Nice, and I, I guess, yeah. I'm Mofi on on the get side, do you think that's needed right now? Um, possibly. Um, so one thing I just recently realized uh, from Terrence's uh, write up of the implementation notes is uh, the current implementation of uh, to computing the proof from the blobs is not quite as efficient. Um, as I as I would hope, and um, I was gonna look into like what we could do to like optimize that um, once I've done with the DevNet, but um, I'm not sure if there are any further. So we have the we have the proof computation implemented in CKCG, and it's fairly awesome. well optimized. So you can yeah, use that. I... Yeah. The only thing is not yet it's not parallelized. So, but we we could do that like. There's a simple way to make it uh, parallelized as well, but uh, it wasn't a priority so far. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely. But it uses that. like uh, Pippinger for doing the multi-scalar multiplication, so it's uh, it's quite fast. Cool. Yeah. Um, Alexa said in the chat uh, they're from Nethermind and they're looking for an implementation, so it might be neat to like, yeah. Uh, for them to use that to, to start. And so we can get some, some feedback on it and it might be easier to use it from the scratch than to swap whatever's in guess already. Cool. Yeah. Um, Alexa, I assume you're in the Discord and, and the, yeah, the chat. Telegram is better for contacting you than Discord. Cool. Uh, sweet. Um, uh, okay, and then next up, uh, Danny, you had a document about uh, sync coupling, uh, which is something we've talked about uh, for many weeks. Do you want to quickly 
recap. Yeah, I can just go over that. I was just thinking about it the other day and wanted to jot down some notes. Um, pretty much there's two things. It's gossip and historic sync. Um, gossip, we currently have the sidecar approach rather than coupling. Um, historic sync, I think, is still to be defined. Um, are still being debated more. Um, and there's two things that I think we want to minimize. You know, it's the, the complexity of the change going into 4844, and then the potential complexity and the change going into full dank sharding. Um, I make an argument that on the kind of gossip approach with the sidecar, we this does mimic some of the potential problem that we're going to see and given kind of like the race condition between these two type of message types on gossip because we will see it in full sharding because we're distributing rows and columns rather than the full blocks, but you still have the kind of the same thing. Uh, but I also argue that the signature approach that we're using today doesn't actually really mirror um, what will happen in full dank sharding unless builders are bonded and they have a signature and they could potentially be slashed. Um, and so because of that, I do question on the gossip and I've, I've, I think what we initially was arguing for decoupling as they are today, uh, but I do question the value of the decouple now, given that I don't think it maps directly to what gossip looks like in full dank sharding. That said, the decoupling does allow us for um, alternative push versus pull uh, methods that we've been discussing today. So in that context, my argument, you know, I'm more than just kind of laying off the trade-offs. And if we are going to be engineering some sort of push versus pull, we certainly would want uh, them to be decoupled. Uh, additionally, with the um, historic sync, we have, the, we have these like blocks by root, blocks by range requests where we can request one or many blocks um, by a range or by a specific root. Um, I think coupling here is is bad uh, because I think it, it kind of messes up a relatively robust mechanism by putting in a bunch of additional conditional logic, especially because the pruning depth of uh, blobs is going to be different than the pruning depth of beacon blocks. And so now you have kind of this stuff you have to handle. Maybe there's not a, a, a root, maybe I mean, there's not a blob, maybe there's um, do you want the blob, like different kind of stuff. So I think it's easier to put it as an adjunct protocol with kind of these parallel methods rather than coupling. Um, and uh, if we coupled today, we would add that complexity and then we'd have to remove it in full dank sharding. So I think it's it's much more clear to me that the coupling on the historic sync uh, requests does not, adds more complexity today and adds more complexity in the future. The coupling on the gossip, I could potentially go either way. I think that if we weren't doing any sort of sophisticated push pull, great. We probably should just have them coupled. I think it's much simpler um, and doesn't buy us too much in the future by doing the decoupling. But if we do want the push pull, we should keep them decoupled. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> any thoughts on that? Um, I guess like I'm thinking, it makes sense, but I also think like if we do couple either dis um, distribution or peer to peer, we have to like it has to be consistent. Otherwise, you end up with a case where um, you gossip like the block, and for some reason the sidecar doesn't the a peer doesn't observe the sidecar, and then the node has to like make a request for it. Would you rather right. have like the full coupled? payload or just you know just keep them separate that's an argument i think again like i'd call that quote historic that's not quite historic retrieval but like that's also another argument for keeping them decoupled on historic retrieval just because you you you're more likely to get a beacon block than maybe this blob um and if you have one and you don't have the other you're going to want to make a direct request and you don't necessarily want the thing you already have um, so that's like a beacon, that's a blobs by root request or beacon by root request. Um, and so, but I don't necessarily think that if gossip is coupled, that you don't want to decouple the historic requests because decoupling the historic requests kind of, it seems independent. 
even if you receive these things in tandem on gossip, no problem. If you're getting the historic request, um, you can, you're, you're saying specifically, what do I, what I want. And so it doesn't have the same issue of like information being missing. Um, I don't think I was very clear in that response though. I apologize. No, no, you, what you said makes sense. I'm just thinking it like through. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. And I guess just for clarity, like for the next version of the DevNet, we probably don't need to change what we're doing for sync. Um, but then probably the one after that we would want to. Um, does that does that make sense? Yeah, I apologize for my ignorance. Do we have these like signed blobs by range requests in the P2P spec right now? I don't think they're signed. I think they're just blobs. Okay, blobs. Yeah. And I do put a note on uh, may, like there's probably no hurt in putting making it a signed variant, but um, I don't know if it's actually that valuable to have them signed for the historics because of you don't necessarily even know the proposer ID when you're getting these historic blocks. So like you can't necessarily validate them independently. Whereas if, when you're in the head within a certain time, uh, slot range, you do know the proposer ID. So you do, you can pre-validate before you get the beacon block. I guess another thing I was thinking of the other day, which is interesting because like right now the blobs are, 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 are not chain, right? They don't have the parent feel. So for example, for blob, for a block today, when you backtrack syncing, you can just get the children. If the children is valid, then you can ensure all the ancestors are valid. But blobs don't have this property. And I wonder if it's useful to add that property in there. In the signed variant or just in blobs in general? To just, in ge better. just in general, where you can just say if the children is valid, then the parents must be valid. But for now, you have to verify them one by one by one by one. Right. I I don't know if you could actually shoehorn that into the commitment scheme. I see. I was thinking like hashing all the commitment and just made that as the parent root or something, but that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> Um, okay, I do have we're to run right now. I'm sorry, talk to us soon. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, if some folks can stay on another five or so minutes, uh, I think the last thing that would be important to cover is there's a bunch of people who like aren't part of uh client teams and uh want to contribute to this, and it's kind of a a first to have this many folks uh wanting to contribute. Um and 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 the, the hard bit is I think finding you know what are like useful tasks that are pretty uh, well defined or that like no one is already on where uh, they they can have an impact. Um, I guess you know I'll, I'll just open the floor here. Does anyone have like something they feel like would be really important that nobody's looking at, and if somebody else could like take it, it would make their life easier. Okay. In this, yeah. Proto. Yeah, please. So in terms of implementation, there are the obvious candidates around already. We have Prism Gav prototypes and then an uh, Lighthouse prototype that was started during um, Berlin. In terms of tooling, there's a lot to build. So if you want to start smaller, I would recommend starting there. One of the things um, is more tooling to create blobs and insert transactions or integrate it into existing tooling like Foundry. And just having some kind of explorer to view the blobs that are being confirmed on the DevNet would be really useful. Yeah, explorer to visualize the blobs, that would be great. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of the implementations themselves, so as I understand it, Prism and Guess are obviously the most uh, advanced. Uh, Lighthouse, uh, if there's, yeah, if we can get a link to the prototype, I'll, I'll keep track of that. The Nethermind, uh, Alexa, I said, uh, they're starting to look into it. Uh, I believe Trang, who's on the call here, is uh, going to start looking at an Aragon implementation as well. Um, 
so I'll, I'll try and keep track of all of those. And I've put together a, a sort of checklist like we had for EIP 1559. If you start working on an implementation, um, you can just open a PR and, and link it there. And then if you have like issues on your implementation that you need help with, um, I think that's helpful because people can kind of go through that. Um, the other bit I think uh, that would, would still be really good is just uh, testing. Um, so we don't have, uh, we have a little bit of consensus tests uh, that I think Danny uh, put together. I don't think we have anything on the execution layer yet, uh, unless I've, I've missed it. Um, so if, if somebody's keen to like, look at basically the hive or the state tests um, and, and dive into that, that would be quite valuable. Um, anything else? Um, and then, yeah. oh, sorry. oh, sorry. And then we talked also about the, the sort of uh, um, not uh, basically the, 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 the spamming of like a single node, a book learner, I believe you were talking about that. I think that would still be quite valuable, like kind of getting performance metrics on one node that's being spammed by blobs and see if it you know stays in sync and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm working on that, so I can continue yep. working yep. on it. If anyone yep. else is interested, please reach out. Um, I'd be happy to give you access to my note and stuff. Um, someone was saying something. And yeah, I, I was just going to say that I think like something that's more generic that's generally always useful in these kinds of scenarios is writing either summaries or comparisons of like open issues. So if somebody was interested in contributing uh, I think it'd be cool to write like uh, just an overview of the different ideas, you know, maybe for a sync, like comparing two different things and just like laying out the conversation points that have been had in, in calls and on the various um, different threads that, that, that we've been discussing. And I think, yeah, Danny sort of done that for sync. I think the bit where it might be helpful is like for the, the, the KCG libraries. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, just like looking at what's there and what they're, they're yeah, what the, the trade-offs are. I don't know if there's any other um, areas um, like that. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, I just wanted to add um, something that as we get like more client implementations, um, alternative um, tooling, it would help to have like uh, test vectors against um, what we have in the spec so that everyone is like on the same page of like what certain outputs should look like. Um, so for example, like I think, um, who was it? Marius brought up like uh, a bug in our implementation of the um, SSC route for the newly updated beacon block. And I think like, there was a mismatch between theirs and ours, and it turns out there was a bug in our fork of Prism. And with the test vector, it would have been easy to like cross check what we we're doing was uh, correct. Got it. And what's the right like format for those test vectors? Just like JSON tests, or? Yeah, I think JSON is works fine. Um. I, yeah, I know Marius had like the ones for M4. I can't find the link now, but um, yeah, I think if we, if we, you know, if I, I'll try and find the link to those um, and, and kind of share them as an example of what it looked like for the very early merge ones. Um, yeah. um, Okay, and then Proto added some thoughts on the Explorer. I'll copy all of your comment, Proto, in the uh, in the notes for this call. Um, anything else in terms of tooling? Um, Amofi, you have like this blob utils uh, repo. Is there anything there that you know you've been meaning to do but just never got the chance? Um. Well, sort of related is, um, so Proto has this PR in Prism to, um, so right now, the only way to download blobs is if you're the peer-to-peer -peer network, but ideally, um, this should be done using the Beacon API, even if it's uh, like an internal API. So you can just talk to your 
um, beacon node directly and just download the blob that it already has. I would like that PR merged. I haven't had the time to take a look at that. It would be helpful if someone could, uh, I, I can link it in, but um, we could like I can, polish it. I can rebase and polish it. I just need a, a, a target to test against. So it needs to be clear which brains to use and which does not. Okay, I'll stick with you offline then, Proto. Um, and I think the one other bit that's like uh, th that would be valuable is like uh, Mofi. We have like your DevNet guide uh, for DevNet one. I think if if someone like wants to polish that and uh, make it, you know, like if somebody's like going through that basically and like stuff is you know not obvious or anything like kind of extending that i think over time like making it easier and easier for people to like join the devnet um and 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 like you know not have to run a bunch of custom commands or if they do you know knowing like what like the failure modes are um is, is really valuable so um yeah I'll, I'll i'll link that as well but just like documenting if you're like playing around with this stuff and and finding some edge cases or issues like documenting what you uh yeah what you did to make it work so that's the next person it's slightly easier for them is, is really valuable yep yep totally um yeah. i think yeah a couple of people have had like issues connecting yeah. to the devnet and like a troubleshooting section should yeah. uh like easy yeah. way to like figure out your problem should be really helpful yeah cool yeah i think that was that was worth having as a conversation um, anything else people think uh, we need help with? Okay, if not, um, yeah, just uh, as we're closing, uh, I've put together this sort of checklist like we had for 1559. Um, uh, I mentioned it before, but like I've, I've just included the chat here. If you are working on the client implementation or start working on test vectors or whatnot, uh, please um, add your stuff there. And so other people will be able to see. I'll try and add uh, all of the stuff we discussed on, and mentioned on this call uh, to it uh, today. So it's 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 pretty up to date. Um, and I think that'll be just like an easy place where we can track all the different things that are that are going on. Um, and then with like less than a minute uh, to go, uh, Trent, where is the best place for people who want updates on the whole KZG ceremony? There's a timeline document, uh, but generally there's a best place is the repo in uh, Ethereum slash KZG ceremony. Repo has a bunch of resources and a link to the timeline document. Cool. But the TLDR is that it will launch post DevCon, run for two months, and then there's a special contribution period and we have grants available, a whole bunch of stuff. If you want to make your own implementation or uh, create a unique randomness generation, Please reach out. Sounds good. Anything else before we close? Okay. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah. Talk to you all on Discord. Bye. Hi. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.